going to North Rock Church, honey, I'll stand y'all's feet and worship us. series multiply we're gonna get you out of here in just about one hour okay do me a favor give someone next to you a high five and say stay warm with me And great are you, 
His presence in this place today, and I can only think of, of Jesus, His Son, His perfect Son, leaving His place, His rightful place on the throne next to His Father in heaven, and He came here to this earth to us. We didn't deserve it. He didn't have to, but He chose to. He willingly gave up His life for us and died a terrible death so that we could live. And not only that, but God is so constant and he loves us the same today, yesterday, tomorrow. Regardless of, of how we woke up today, maybe, maybe what we're going through this week, maybe what we did yesterday or what we're going to do next week. He loves us. He always will. He's so constant and he is worthy of our praise. And this morning we're going to sing a new song. and It's pulled from this scripture found in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. And it goes like this. Now, these are angels it's talking about, and it says in a loud voice, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So as we sing this today, just declare that to him, that he is worthy of praise, he is strong, and he is powerful. It all revolves around your throne. Who can know the glory? So high above, be it slain for us.
clap our hands for him. Can we do that? Worthy is the Lamb of God. Worthy is the Lamb of God. And he does reign. He does reign over every area of your life. He reigns over your home, your, your, your marriage, your career, over the good days, over the bad days, the hills and the valleys. He is 100 percent in control and you need to be reminded of that this morning it's why I love this song it reminding me of how in control our God is of everything I want to pray for your needs this morning we're going to sing this just a little bit more in a moment but before we do I want to pray for your needs that thing that you brought in the building today that's kind of weighing you down that's it's causing you to have some stress and some anxiety. I want to pray about that particular thing. So if you have a need here today, and it can be big, it can be small, it could be a financial thing, an emotional thing, a relational thing, whatever it is, I want to take that to God and surrender it to Him. So all over the building, all over the building, if you have a need, would you just hold your hand up high in the air by faith? Anything at all, hold it high, leave it there. Lord Jesus, you see those needs. God, every hand raised represents a heart, represents a mind, Lord. And we understand, God, that we need you. We trust in you. We lean on you, God. And we bring our needs to you. We lay them at your feet, Lord. We're surrendering them to you, knowing that you are in control and that you do reign supreme, Lord. So, Jesus, I pray that even now, as we bring these needs to you, that, that peace would fall in this room, that hope would fall in this room, that help would fall in this room, Lord Jesus. Lord, peace for the troubled mind, hope for the soul that feels like there's no tomorrow, healing for the relationships, Lord, healing God for the minds, healing, Lord Jesus, for those who need a physical touch, Lord. We're leaning on you and we're trusting in you. We believe in you, Jesus, by the power and the authority that is in your name. We release it to you in Jesus' name. One more time now, let's thank him for meeting our needs and standing beside us. Come on, come on, come on. Sing glory. Welcome to North Rock Church. We are so excited that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us. Pastor Jonathan will be up in a moment to continue our series, Multiply. But first, here's some things coming up around North Rock Church. If today is your first time at North Rock, we want to say thank you for coming. You are our VIP and all of the North Rock family wants to welcome you. Do us a huge favor and fill out a connection card in the seat in front of you and drop it off at our VIP tent on your way out today. Our team would love to say hello, answer any questions you have, and give you a gift to say thank you for being with us today. We hope you enjoy your time with us and we hope to see you back soon. At North Rock, we believe everyone should be connected to the local church and we would love for North Rock to be that church for you. The way you get connected at North Rock is through Growth Track. Growth Track will be happening next week 
in the office complex next to our building immediately following the second service at 11.15 a.m. A growth track will tell you about North Rock, about membership, and will give you the opportunity to join our Rockstar team. Lunch will be on us and we'll even take care of your kids. We can't wait to see you at Growth Track. If you haven't had a chance to visit our online small group directory, plan to do so today. It's easy to get connected. Simply visit us at northrocksa.com, click on small groups and scroll through our online directory. If you're not seeing the type of group you're looking for, you can still facilitate a group. Register it online and we'll be in touch with the next steps to get your group going. Don't do life alone. Get in a small group today. Hey North Rock, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. is First Wednesday Prayer. If you haven't been to a First Wednesday before, be sure to make it out this week. We're going to spend time in worship and prayer. We're going to take communion as a church body and we're going to have an opportunity to hang out and fellowship with one another. So if you haven't been, or maybe you have, be sure to come out this week for First Wednesday Prayer. everybody. Good to see you all. You're looking spry this morning on this beautiful crisp fall morning. Love, uh, love, love, love uh, winter in San Antonio, Texas. This is how it should be. Now, we won't talk about our summers, but I do love winter in San Antonio, and we're glad that you're here for week two of Multiply. Uh, would you all do me a favor, and let's make some noise for everybody watching via live stream today. We're glad you're with us as well. And I, I love this series for this time of the year because uh, we kind of are entering into this season where generosity and, and giving just kind of becomes who we are by default. We by default are thinking about others. And I want to share with you a couple of uh, pretty cool ways that, that at North Rock we, we're going to give you an opportunity to bless others over the next four to six weeks. Um, first of all, you had in your chair when you came in today some little cards that look just like this. They look like tickets. Will you grab those and hold them in your hand? Hold them in your hand. Everybody play along. Hold them in your hand. Uh, this is our At The Movies series, which is one of our favorite series that we get to do around here at North Rock. And uh, it, it launches two weeks from this weekend on November the 10th and the 11th or 11th and 12th, whatever that is. I'm not sure what weekend that is. 11th and 12th, maybe it is. Uh, whatever, it, it launches here in two weeks from, from today. And uh, this is one of those series we kind of take a little cinematic adventure uh, for four straight weekends. And it's like modern day parables where we are, we are taking uh, popular Hollywood movies and we're extracting some incredible biblical principles from them. And uh, I encourage you, hey, of course you got to be here, but you need to bring somebody with you. This is one of those series that you can bring someone to, um, whether or not they are accustomed to going to church, or maybe they don't even think they like church. I promise you, they will like this. We're going to have popcorn and a variety of other things. It's going to be an incredible series. So I encourage you to bring somebody with you. Pass these things out like Candy. We have a lot more of these, and we encourage you to give them to people you know, people you love, people you don't know, people you don't love. It doesn't matter. Just give them to people. Um, additionally, six weeks from today, six weeks from today, the weekend of December 9th and 10th, um, we are we are uh, ha having our annual Legacy Weekend, and this is your one time a year opportunity to give um, above and beyond. Of course, you can do it throughout the year, but this is one time. 
time where we have a special push uh, to give above and beyond our, our tithing to help accelerate um, God's vision for North Rock Church as we move into 2018. And um, not, not just in our church, but in our, in our, in our city, in our, in our nation, and even around the world. And uh, there are so many places that are blessed and kind of have this ripple effect of blessing because you give so willingly. And uh, this is an incredible opportunity for you to participate and make a difference. And we're telling you six weeks in advance so that you can have time to pray about it, talk to God about it. God, what would you have me do? Talk to your families about it. What, what do you all think that we should do? And plan on that weekend to come and bring that amazing Christmas gift offering to, uh, to God through in the form of, of a, a legacy Offering. There are many organizations that we bless through this offering. One of them is, is a, a movement called the Association of the Related Churches, the ARC. And they are a church planning organization that we are a part of and we, we help fund every month. And uh, man, just in 2017 alone, uh, the ARC has planted 120 brand new churches around the United States of America that you have helped to fund. You are making a difference, not just here, but all over the United States. So we encourage you to pray about this offering. Think about what you can do. Now let's just get honest for a second. I mean, church is a great place to be honest if, if we're going to be honest, right? Um, how many of you will admit that you like stuff? You just like stuff uh, from, from phones to cars to clothes to, well, you name it, you fill in the blank. You love stuff. And I know that there are people in this room who would probably fall into the category of being a, a hoarder. Uh, you, you, you hoard stuff. Like the idea of parking in your garage is laughable. What? Parking, that's, that's where my stuff is. I can't park there. Um, uh, you, you, you have a room in your house that when people come see your house, you don't let them go into that room because that's where your stuff is. I mean, the door's closed, so there's so much stuff in that room. Uh, you, 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 maybe, maybe you can't pass up a sale. I mean, you're a sucker for a sale. Um, one thing that's kind of killed us in our household is this, this thing right here, um, this, this right here. And uh, this is one of those. This is one of those tactics by the devil. I mean, because I mean, you can even set up the one-click purchase option, and just with one click of the button, you'll have that thing in the next day or, or or two days. It's just really amazing how it works. I've even heard stories of people accidentally buying things. And there's a, a dude I heard recently was kept the, he liked these particular nice pens, pens, writing pens, and they kept showing up uh, every few days. He would get more pens, and he's like, "Well, how is this? How is this happening? Who's ordering these pens?" And he went and looked and discovered it was he, he that had been ordering it. Now, there was some Ambien involved um, in the process. But Amazon makes it so easy uh, that it made one click and, and you can purchase more stuff, stuff, stuff. We love our stuff. And in the 66 books of the Bible, um, the topic of money and possessions of stuff, either directly or indirectly, comes up over 2,000 times. you got to ask yourself, Why? I mean, does God really care that much about money? Does He care that much about, about stuff? How many, how many parents do we have in the house? You have children of your own, okay? Yep. It's amazing when those beautiful little angels start to talk and they say such sweet things. You know, da, da, ma, ma, ma. Mine would say, ba, ba, ba. It was one of their first words. Uh, um, but then there's another word that comes on, man, early, early on in their life. And you might be walking past the living room and there might be another child in there. You know, someone's come to visit and uh, moms are hanging out. Kids are in the living room. And suddenly you hear, mine, mine. Right, like one of the first words they learn to say is just riddled with evil and selfishness. And listen to me, it's not just irony that of all the sins that we could see in our toddlers, the first one is almost always selfishness as it relates to their, that's nice, as it relates to, <laughs> see about, I don't know. Six weeks ago, five weeks ago, we had this thing where we shot off confetti and we're still feeling the effects of it. <clears throat> but it's not just irony that, uh, that selfishness shows up even in our toddlers. 
And the reason the Bible talks so much about money is that God knows that, that things and stuff are the number one competition for our heart. Now, as believers, as followers of Christ, we don't, we don't want to live in selfishness. We want to be selfless. We want to be caring. We want to be generous. And so we couldn't be talking about a more important topic today. Last week we talked about God's way, God's cycle of abundance versus the way so many of us live, this cycle of scarcity. And I want to revisit that just to kind of recap and share with you briefly what we talked about last week as a reminder. We talked about how God supplies, and if we're living in the cycle of scarcity, usually we consume first. We don't give first, we we consume first. And And after we consume, and Americans are really good at that, after we buy stuff and spend and consume, uh, we start to lack. The money runs out, and there's still some month left. And and so now we're afraid. Now we're afraid. We consume, we lack, we're afraid. And so when we get a little bit more, we just consume and gobble it all up for ourselves as well because we're already kind of behind the eight ball. And this cycle of scarcity is perpetuated. But God says, I have a better way of living for you. It's, it's abundance. It's abundance. And, and how abundance works is God supplies and we give. We give first. We don't consume first. We give first. And when we give first, God tends to multiply. He multiplies what we give. We give. He multiplies. And when that happens, now our faith grows because we ex- we've experienced God's blessings of, of multiplication and our faith is huge and so what are we going to do? We're going to give more. We're going to continue this cycle of abundance and God's calling us to live here and too many of us have lived here and most of the time it's, it's not because we don't want to give, it's because our mindset is just, it's just wrong and so listen, I, I don't think that in, in general Americans, I don't think in general that we are stingy. I think most of the time it's because we're strapped and we're not prepared. We don't feel like we can. And so one of the things at North Rock that we want to do for you is we want to try to give you some tools to find freedom in your finances. And um, if, if you want to write this down, as we get into January, on, on actually January the 26th, we're bringing a, a Christian financial guru, Mr. Joe Sangle, back to North Rock Church for one night only. And he's going to teach his financial learning experience to help help us with our with our budgeting, with our with our saving, with how to kind of make our money makes sense for us. So I encourage you to make sure that that is part of your plans as you start planning your new year. Um, but today, today I want to talk about one of the greatest miracles that Jesus ever performed. And it's a miracle of crazy, crazy multiplication. Last week, last week we talked about how God loves math. And God's favorite math is multiplication. And this is one of those crazy miracles of multiplication where Jesus fed uh, 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 5,000. It's known as the feeding of the 5,000. By the way, he actually fed more than 5,000 that day, a lot more, because Jewish custom in that era was only to count adult males in the crowd. So there were 5,000 men, adult men in the crowd. Uh, But we know that there were tons of of wives and children there as well. It's estimated that he really fed between 15 and 20,000 people in this this incredible miracle. So to kind of help you put that into perspective, if you've ever been to a Spurs game and sat in the AT&T Center whenever it was packed from the floor to the nosebleeds, it seats 18,000 you know, and change. And so that's about how many people Jesus fed in this incredible miracle that we're about to read to you. Mark chapter 6, the gospel of Mark in the New Testament, chapter 6 verse 34, says when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus was driven by compassion. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Many things. Everybody say many things. He preached a long sermon. By this time, it was late in the day. And the disciples came to him and said, Jesus, this is like a remote place. And it's already really late. Verse 36 says, What we should probably do is send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So I want you to picture with me. 
Jesus has compassion on these people, and so he's teaching them. And, and uh, you know, Jesus doesn't run out of content. He, he got plenty of content. Uh, he's the Word made flesh. So he got plenty to say, and he's preaching a long sermon. Like, he preached a sermon series all in one day. And, and, and you can just imagine uh, uh, the Apostle Peter kind of approaching Jesus and saying, Jesus, hey, um, listen, I, I, th- what this, this sermon series that you're preaching, it's unbelievable. Like that 18th point that you just made a minute ago. <laughs> Incredible. Life-changing. I've already tweeted it. But but Jesus, um, as good as it is, you know, the, you know the sun. You know how the sun works. You know, you create it. So you know how the sun works, and it's getting low in the sky, and it's starting to set. And so there are some people, there's some people that are, that are getting pretty, pretty hungry. As a matter of fact, I've seen some people that are kind of hangry, and, and you don't you don't want that to you don't want that to happen, you know, in the crowd. Jesus, uh, there's no chilies nearby, there, and no chewies. Um, so, so now, Jesus, if it were me, I could stay here with you all night long. You know, Jesus, you could preach and preach. I'd be fine. But some of the other disciples, you know, Peter and uh, or James and, and John specifically, they're they're a little, they're frustrated and they're thinking that we should probably let these people go get something to. Eat. And so he said, let them go to the countryside and villages and buy, everybody say buy, buy themselves something to eat. The disciples' were perspective were they should buy. But he answered and said, Jesus answered and said, you give, everybody say give, you give them something to eat. So interesting here and intriguing here, these two different mindsets, how the disciples were focused on buying And Jesus was focused on giving. Buying perpetuates that scarcity cycle in our lives. Giving drives that cycle of abundance in our lives. Two completely different mindsets. So Jesus answered and said, you give them something to eat. But the the verse 37 continues and says, but Jesus, that would take more than a half, half of a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? They're they're focused on what they don't have. They're focused on the fact that we don't have enough. The AT&T Center is full of people. How, How are we supposed to give them something to eat? We don't have enough. But Jesus said, stop. Stop focusing on what you don't have and let's... Let's ask the question instead, what do we have? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. And when they found out, they said, we have five loaves and two fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish. So there are two mindsets at work here. Again, the disciples with a scarcity mindset. We don't have enough. In fact, it's laughable how little we have compared to what really needs to be done and I think all of us have been there in our lives. We've all been there one way or another. Man, just a few you know, weeks ago, during the gas Armageddon in San Antonio, 2017, right? everybody was, was living in scarcity as it relates to fuel in their automobiles. And I got to go buy more gas. I got to go buy more gas. I can't relax. I got to go buy more gas. We got to find where there's gas. We're driving an hour across town and sitting in line for two hours just to fill, you know, put $12 worth of gas in our car uh, because we, we had this scarcity mentality. We, we've, all, we've all been there at different times. When, when, when North Rock had the opportunity to purchase this incredible facility, I mean, we were a church of whatever, 300 and 50 people in a high school. How in the world can we, can we do that? I felt like we did not have enough. But according to Jesus, we had plenty. Plenty is, in the eyes of Jesus, whatever you have. Whatever you have, if you'll bring it and you'll put it into my hands, Jesus said, it will be enough. Disciples were driven by scarcity. But Jesus was driven by abundance. He was like, there's more. Oh, you got five loaves of bread and two fish. We can work with that. Just give it to me. Give it to me and let me show you what I can do. And as a matter of fact, if you'll fast forward to the end of the story, in Matthew's account of the story, Matthew 14 and verse 20, Matthew said they all ate. Everybody in the AT&T Center ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Jesus said, if you'll give me what you do have, even though it seems so insignificant, if you'll put it in my hands and just allow me to go to work on it, I promise you it is 
plenty. They said it's laughably small, and Jesus said it's more than enough. God's economy is so different from the world's economy. And as followers of Christ, he tends to completely redefine what he can do with just a little, with just a little bit of talent, with just a little gifting, with just a little money. He can take it and multiply it and make something amazing out of it. And remember, guys, remember, If you view life through the lens of scarcity, like we were talking about a moment ago and last week, you're always going to deal with fear and anxiety. But Jesus doesn't want you to live that way. He has a completely different plan for your life. It's a plan of abundance. John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, this is the words of Jesus, came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundantly. Everything about Jesus is abundant. It's excessive. Everything about Jesus is more than enough. Give me the loaves and the fish. We're going to feed everybody, and we're still going to have more left over. We're going to have extra left over. Extra. I've been wondering what in the world this is in my chair for today. Well, we really didn't have a good reason until yesterday when I was studying. I thought, we're going to have extra left over. Extra. Now, every time you chew a piece of gum, I hope that you think about how God tends to multiply. And God wants to bring abundance and, and, and extra and more than enough into your life. Everything about God is more than enough. So why do so many people... Miss out on this abundant life that God has for us. I want to cover two quick multiply ideas from this passage. And the first one is this. If you're taking notes, if you're taking notes, number one, God multiplies what is blessed. God multiplies what is blessed. The story continues, and, and they brought the five loaves of bread and the fish to Jesus And in in verse number 40 of Mark chapter 6, it says they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. They had the people sit down, and Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven, and he blessed them. Everybody say blessed. He blessed them. I want you to hear me. God's blessing over any area of our lives is a game changer. Any area of our lives. God's blessing over our parenting, God's blessing over our marriage, God's blessing over our career, game changer, and God's blessing over our finances is a game changer. As as I mentioned last week, and I want to mention it again today, um, returning the tithe to God releases His blessing in our life. Returning the tithe to God, according to Scripture. The tithe is, is, is from a Hebrew word, ma'asar, which means one-tenth. And God set it up in His economy from the very beginning that the first 10% of our income is not ours, according to Scripture. God set it aside for Himself. And it's, it's not just 10%. It's the first 10%. Okay, God has to be first in our life, in every area of our life. If we put Him first, it's amazing how everything else seems to just fall into place. And as a matter of fact, I want to read a passage that I read last week, and I want to look at it through a little different lens today, a different perspective, but it's from the book of Malachi. And Malachi is an Old Testament prophet. He was, he was, the, the Old Testament prophets were the voice of God to their people. As a matter of fact, Malachi was one of the last three prophets before the birth of Jesus. So in this passage, God is speaking directly to his people through Malachi. And he says these words, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. We talked about this last week. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. Floodgates of heaven is is, is the phrase that I want to focus on for just a moment because this, this phrase shows up in the Old Testament three different times. Here in Malachi, in, in the book of 2 Kings, and in Genesis. And in Genesis, it's relating to the great 
flood. You know, the flood that, that covered the whole earth and Noah built the ark and all that business. This phrase represents and signifies and, and talks about the, the power of that great flood. So uh, when Malachi says uh, the floodgates of heaven will open up and blessings will pour out on you, when they heard these words, the Hebrews, they would, they would think back to, to the very first time, and everybody knew the story of the great flood. Everybody knew the story of what happened with Noah and the ark. So in order to understand God's blessings, we need to talk about and, and ask the question about the flood. What, what do we know about the flood? Because this is the way that God chose to illustrate His blessings on those who put Him first. First. Well, we know that there's a ridiculous amount of water, of course, and, and that it covered the whole earth. In fact, the scripture literally says no part of the earth was left untouched. No part of the earth was left untouched. So, so when I tithe, how will God bless me? Well, it's like a huge lake behind a dam just waiting to pour blessings out into my life, but not just my finances, but into every area of my life, every area of my life, my marriage, my home, my parenting, my career, until nothing is left untouched. Listen, the blessing of the tithe is not because God is like a, you know, greedy and stingy and like a used car salesman and he's trying to convince you, if you'll bring the tithe down to the local storehouse, then I will open it. It's, it doesn't work like that. That's not how God is. But God simply wants to see who has a heart to put him first. He wants to see who he knows he can trust with multiplication and blessing because you won't be stingy and you won't be selfish. You've proven that you're putting him first. And so he's willing to open up the floodgates of heaven and shower abundance out on you that you literally can't even contain. Floodgates of heaven. When you think about heaven, what things come to mind? I mean, abundance, abundant provision, of course, everything that we need. And, of course, all throughout the Scripture we're told that if we'll put God first, all of our needs will be taken care of. And so certainly there's abundant provision, but, but let's put that aside. When you think about heaven, I think about the undiluted presence of God in my life. His, his overwhelming peace and uncontrollable joy that he offers when I put him first. I just heard a story last week about a couple named Zach and Ashley. And, and they made the decision that instead of continuing to tip God as it, as it were, that they were going to obey the word of God and start living according to the principle of the tithe. To give the first 10% and then to allow God to then bless the remaining 90%. Um, and, and, and just see what, what would happen. And, and they said, of course, financially we were, we were well taken care of, but that's not even what they wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about how since they started tithing, how much more peace they have in their life and, and, and how, how strong their marriage is and how much more intimacy they, they feel with one another and how when they come to church, they used to just kind of come and sit during the worship, but now... They come, and, 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 and Zach actually said, I, I, there are tears every worship service that I come into. I feel the presence of God in a, such, in a, in a so much more real way. It's like he's like one inch from me. And God didn't change, of course, but, but they changed. Their mindset changed. They gave. He multiplies, and now their faith has grown. Don't we all want our faith to grow? And listen, if, 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 if you feel stuck in your faith journey today and tithing is not part of your life, I dare you to try it. I challenge you to try it and just watch your faith skyrocket when you start living your life God's way. God's way works, folks. Trust me. You trust Him with your heart. You trust Him with your life. You can trust Him with your finances. His way absolutely works. It works. Floodgates. Blessings that we can't even contain. God multiplies. The second big multiply idea from this story is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. God multiplies what is given away. God multiplies what is given away. 
The story continues in, in, in verse 41 of, of, of Mark chapter 6 and says, Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them, then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. To share. Jesus just kept breaking it and giving it. Breaking, once he got it into his hands, it just began to multiply. And he kept breaking it and giving it, and they just kept passing it out. They, they Section B, uh, Section D, way up high in the nosebleeds, up there, uh, you know, Manu's section, and then, you know, they eased over to, and, and they, just, they just kept giving it out until everybody had eaten. But where did the miracle happen? Why did the miracle happen? We are told in the Gospels that the, the, the loaves and the fish came from a little boy. What, what, do you have, what do you have to give? Jesus said, what do you have? Well, I don't know what we have. And they're looking around, they found a boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, the boy didn't have to give his food, did he? He could have said, well, I don't know what y'all going to eat, but I know what I'm eating. You know, he could have, you know, bibbed up and just been sitting there eating away while everybody else is starving. Jesus is teaching and I'm having a good time. Uh, but, but, but he willingly, by faith, surrendered what he had and put it into the hands of his Savior and allowed God to do something with it. He trusted that even though I'm giving this away right now, I know that God can multiply and bless and that I'm going to be satisfied and my needs are going to be met even though I'm giving it away right now. I, I, I want you to hear me today as we, as we close. What you have has the potential to multiply, but you won't see it until you release it. You won't see it until you give it. The first move is yours. It's yours. The first move is yours. And we've experienced this so many times in our life. A few years ago, actually it's been some years ago now, Alicia and I gave sacrificially. We were young, and we gave sacrificially in, in, a, in a special offering. And I remember the number, we gave $2,500. And um, the very next week, we, we were having to trust. I mean, honestly, because it was a sacrificial gift for us to give uh, that amount of money. Um, it would be sacrificial now, but it certainly was at that stage in our life. The very next week, I got a phone call, and I had a $5,000 debt. Someone who had no idea that I had just given in this offering uh, from living in a different part of the country. They called me and said, listen, I'm going to forgive you that $5,000. I'm not going to make you pay that back. And in tears that day, I, I went and told Alicia about it. And we sat there and wept, and we thanked God as to how he provides. We had to trust but when we trusted, look what God did. He multiplied. And now our faith has grown. And over the years, we've never been afraid to give because we know how it works. We give. God multiplies. Our faith grows. Our faith grows. God multiplies what is given. He has a way of multiplying your giftings, your talents when you give it to Him. You might think you don't really have anything to offer the kingdom of God. Put it in His hands and just see what He will do with it. But I really don't have much to offer. Give it to Him and just see how He multiplies it to bless others and you. It was amazing as I, as I studied this and it really wasn't until the very end of, the, of my study earlier this week that I just that, that I noticed something something jumped out at me and it, it, it really it's, it's, it's the real heart of the story I mean it's amazing how God again multiplied and fed but, but that, that's indeed the what that's what he did but the question is why why did God multiply and feed why was he there teaching and, and preaching for so long so I want you I want to take you back to Verse number 34, and I want to read it again, the very first verse of this of the story. When Jesus landed and saw a crowd, a large crowd, he had compassion on them. This is the why behind this whole story. This is the why behind this entire sermon series. Because of God's compassion in our lives. Jesus saw these people, and, and to him they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he didn't want them to go home hungry. He didn't want them to go home physically hungry. 
And he didn't want them to go home spiritually hungry. He knew he had what it took to feed them and to teach them and to help their life find purpose and hope. He had compassion for them. Compassion is not just love. Compassion is love with action attached to it. And of course, Jesus went to a cross for those that day and for every single one of us. That's the why behind the what. His compassion for every single one of us. Close your eyes today if you don't mind. I want to I want to say a word of prayer before we move on. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your word and your work. I want to thank you for your life. I want to thank you for what you did and how you did it, why you did it. Lord, I I I pray that there would be courage in this room. Courage that there would be boldness, that there would be audacity to obey your word because your way works. We give you what we have as it relates to talent, our time, our finances. We put it in your hands and you have a way of multiplying and making it go so much further so that everybody is, is fed and our needs are taken care of. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would direct our paths and give us faith. Let faith grow in this room today. In Jesus' name, as I continue to pray here today, I know that there are individuals in this room and you feel feel far from God. You're not in a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you have never surrendered your life to Him. Or maybe at some point in your journey, you you were walking close to Him, but, but you walked away. And you know that you're not close to Jesus anymore, and you need to recommit your life to Him. Either way, I'm, I'm going to pray a simple prayer here in just a moment and allow you the opportunity to surrender. I promise you, He has such compassion and love for you in this room today. He loves you just like you are. In whatever condition you are in today, however you feel today, He loves you just like you are. You may find it hard to love yourself, but He loves you. And He accepts you just like you are. Loving you too much, though, to leave you that way. If you want to be included in this prayer of surrender, surrendering your life to Jesus, no one's looking around but myself and the pastoral team, I'm going to leave you seated right where you are. I'm not going to call you forward, but right where you are. If you'd say, Jonathan, I need to surrender my life to Jesus today. No one's looking around. Would you throw your hand in the air right now and let me see it? Hold it high. Let me see it. That's incredible. Leave it there, please. Thank you. That is beautiful. Thank you so much. Hold them high. Hold them high. Fabulous. Fabulous. All right. You can put your hands down now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer of surrender. And I invite everybody in the room to pray this along with me in your own words. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I need you to save me. I'm starting over today and following you. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you gave your life for me. And you rose from the grave so that I could have freedom. So that I could have power over sin. Thank you for loving me. Forgive me for my sins, Jesus. I repent for my mistakes. I ask that you would make the slate of my life completely clean and fresh. I want to start over and follow you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Hey, let's give a hand to those who took that step of faith today, guys. Come on, a big hand. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That is incredible. And listen, if you took that step of faith today, uh, there's a connection uh, connection card that's in your worship guide. It's also in the seat backs in front of you. Uh, We'd love for you to fill this card out and check the, the box on the very top on the back that says, I committed my life to Christ today. 
You can take this card and drop it in the offering bucket when it comes by in, in a moment. We'd love to have just a, a record of, of you taking this incredible step. And we want to come alongside you as a church. So thank you for doing that. Uh, we're going to prepare right now at this time to give our, our, our weekend tithing and offerings. And while you're preparing to give, I'll mention that we have many ways for you to give and live out your faith through giving. We have a giving kiosk in the foyer. You can give online at our website, northrocksa.com. You can give in here in the buckets uh, when they come by in a moment. You can also give via text giving. Uh, but however it is that you're giving, I want to thank you for doing it. You're making a huge, huge impact in so many lives week after week. Um, as, as the ushers come and we give, we have an incredible organization that is here with us at North Rock today, One Child Matters. And uh, we'll tell you more about that in just a moment, but North Rock is partnering with this incredible organization, and uh, that partnership starts today. And I want to share a little video with you about it while you are giving. Jen Bahasa and I'm a graduate of One Child Matters. I joined the program when I was nine years old and I was sponsored for almost 10 years. I am now a teacher with One Child Matters. The things that was so special to me being part of the program is that it played a great part in my life because God did a lot in my heart um, I know Him, I know how to worship Him, I know the truth, and I've learned that through worshiping God, we can have the salvation we want and we can go to heaven. I was so blessed having a sponsor to help me in my education and because um, she, she helped me a lot in my schools. I feel like I have another family there because she treat me like a daughter and she really loves me and thinks about me. And I love her so much. My relationship with my sponsor, it shows that um, even though we've raised in different country and different culture, but when God works, it doesn't matter anymore. She keeps on sending letters and then just to make sure that I'm fine and doing good for all the good things she did in my life. Maybe I can't pay it all back, but still, I'm so happy having her in my life and hope she could change more life. My name is Jen Bacaso and I'm a living proof that one child matters. So we're excited today to have a friend of mine, James Grout, with us, who's going to tell us a little bit about One Child Matters. And again, North Rock is just thrilled with this opportunity to partner with this incredible organization. And uh, so I'm going to invite James just to tell you a little bit about One Child Matters. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you uh, for the privilege of being here with you. Uh, One Child Matters is kind of a unique name. It's an interesting name. And often when I tell people I work for this organization called One Child Matters, they come back to me with a rather sarcastic question, which is, which child? And my answer to that is mine. Um, <laughs> no, my answer, my, my sarcastic answer back to them is, uh, we don't know yet. But when we find that child, <laughs> that child's going to have an amazing life. The truth is, uh, one child matters, but every child matters too. But let me take you on just a really quick little journey through, uh, through a street filled with impoverished families living in shelters, uh, homes that could tip over at any moment. When I walk through a community like that, and maybe some of you have experienced this, when you walk through a community like that or you see poverty either on television or in a movie or you experience it firsthand, I feel overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed by the amount of need. And, and it, it's, it silences me. It makes me feel like, oh, there is nothing I can do. 
because it, the need is so great. But I want to tell you, maybe you get discouraged like I did a few years ago feeling that way. I want to tell you that's not a lack of compassion on your part or on my part. It's a lack of capacity. It's the realization that I can't actually help all of the people who are in need. But then I realize I can help one. I can help one child. One child matters. I'm holding in my hand uh, Ashley's uh, profile. This is little Ashley. She's six, year, she's six years old. She lives in Nicaragua. And Ashley is one child. And what Ashley needs, one of the things that she needs is one sponsor. One sponsor, one child. We believe in the power of one. But we also believe in the power of multiplication, which means if one of you sponsors Ashley, and then others of you sponsor some of the other children whose profiles are outside, together we begin to make a huge difference in these two communities where you will be partnering, one in Nicaragua and one in the Philippines. So it's one church to one community, but it's, it's multiplication. So what does child sponsorship cost? $39. What does it provide? Here are the really, it's $39 a month. Here are the really tangible things that come with child sponsorship. Nutrition. A lot of these children, this, this will be, when they visit the Hope Center at One Child Matters, it will be the one nutritious meal that they get. The rest of it is not really uh, doing much for them nutrition-wise. They also get help with their education. They get a tutor who pays attention to what's going on in their schools. Sometimes they need help with getting school uniforms so they can actually attend school. We can help them do that as well. They get health screening so we know how they're doing physically. We have child champions who work at our Hope Centers who actually go into the homes to see what the condition of the home is and to make sure that there isn't anything or anyone who is dangerous to the child there. They also get to hear about the love of Jesus. They get to encounter the gospel in a place where they have friends and community and mentors in a safe place, which safe places are hard to find in impoverished communities. Those are the really tangible things that come along with the $39 a month that it costs to sponsor a child. Here's the intangible, and you saw it in Jen's story. Hope and dreams. It's been shown that children who live in poverty rarely have dreams, dreams about their future and who they could be and what they could do. Jen had the experience of being so greatly blessed by One Child Matters in the Hope Center that she grew up in that she actually decided she would go back and become a teacher there. She would give back. This is what sponsorship does. And today we have uh, a lot of children out there that uh, you could possibly sponsor. Actually, we've already had 50 sponsored in the first That's two services, awesome. which is amazing. Woo! So That's great. Awesome. So, so thank you. Thank you for uh, your partnership. Thank you for uh, caring about One Child. And, and um, there, One Child Matters is all over the world, <clears throat> but we are specifically focusing on the Philippines, a village in the Philippines and one in Nicaragua. And uh, what's pretty cool is that we're also going to have the, um, the ability to take some missions trips to the Philippines as well as to Nicaragua in the, in, in the near future. So we'll actually be able to have hands-on, you know, kind of boots on the ground as well as just sending the $39 a month. Uh, but we are so blessed to have this incredible crew with us today. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. And listen, if, if I encourage you to get by there. I, I don't know how many kids he has out there. I do know that there are a lot of children in the Philippines. Uh, but... but 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 I would love for him to go home with no with no kids left unsponsored that he brought to North Rock. So let's make sure that you stop by on your way out today and meet James and uh, and look at some of these amazing, beautiful, beautiful children. Um, listen, tonight is is aftermath. This is our our student. Our, our one big night a month that we have our student event. We have city groups going on um, every weekend, but once a month we have one big one big night right here in this in the auditorium and out front. And uh, doors open at 6 p.m. The service starts at 7. We're all done at 8:30. Uh, they have, there's an incredible guest speaker here tonight uh, from Celebration Church in Georgetown or Austin, Texas. You want your middle school student, your high school student, or your college age student? Make sure that they get to the house tonight. Get them here. It's going to be an incredible, incredible
incredible night. If you're here today and you need prayer for anything at all, our prayer team is standing. They're lined up back there against the wall under the exit sign. They would love to pray with you. Anything at all, they want to pray for you. So don't leave the building without getting prayer if you need prayer. All right? Would you all stand with me? Stand with me all over the building. First Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, Dallas Cowboys at 325 today. God bless you all. Y'all have a great day.